Chapter Twenty Four of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twenty Four: The Unknown Bitter. The day was clear and crisp, but not too bitingly cold. The avenue was filled with an eager throng faces looked over fur collars with a clear redness of skin and a brightness of eyes that added to the springy steps gave an air of festivity to the great thoroughfare betty loved weather like this when she had to walk briskly yet was not too cold to linger a moment at an enticing window to-day she had prepared for a long walk to an uptown store a messenger boy followed ready to carry home her parcels Betty's blue suit of a rough weave and the white beaver hat with a rosette of gilt braid and a pink rose which nestled against her light brown hair made her, with her young happy face, her tall slim figure, her quick step and eager glance, a charming picture. Betty's mind was on the room which they were furnishing for a friend of Miss Minturn's. If this proved satisfactory, they were to redecorate the entire house unfortunately for miss minturn miss stacy limited her to a certain amount and expressed a desire for a furnishing that was both expensive and difficult to obtain early that morning miss minturn had found betty in the study buried in a huge portfolio of plates of furniture she stood looking at her for a moment while a pleased light came into her gray eyes as the girl unaware of her presence studied the designs by the way miss minturn broke in upon betty's studies there's a plate showing exactly the kind of chest i want for miss stacy i must have one she proceeded to describe it minutely pointing out to her pupil all the characteristic marks that room would be perfect if i had a chest like this picture she continued i have looked everywhere for it sally stacy won't consider it a success without that chest she is that way miss minturn looked grieved we shall find it yet betty returned with youthful hope in the improbable i have looked through every antique shop a dozen times and none of them have one and i haven't time to send to london i'd take a hundred dollars out of my own pocket to get it sally stacy never did love me and now she thinks she will show me up as an impostor a faddist who cannot do genuine professional work no matter what the remainder of the furnishings are if i don't have that chest she will talk to everybody as if it were a complete failure in the old days she was never happy until she had given a handsomer dinner or a larger reception than i did and had all the lions as for admirers miss minturn stopped short and pressed her lips tightly together and betty knew that the memory of old rivalry still rankled in a moment however miss minturn was her usual bright self and she began to talk rapidly about her plans particularly those for that day for she was going out of town until evening on her way up the avenue betty was thinking of this conversation and longing to help miss minturn justify herself in the eyes of her former rival she was young enough to love a contest of power the shy red came into betty's face when she went over the last words miss minturn had said it's so good sweetheart to have someone to talk over these things with someone who always understands if poor miss minturn doesn't find her chest she will be terribly disappointed she thought she hurried along abruptly stopping at a window now and then and as abruptly turning away she reached her destination and after an hour or two had made her purchases and with the parcel safely placed in the messenger's sturdy arms she began her homeward walk passing several antique furniture shops she darted into each one to see if by any chance a chest of the right period and dimensions had been received to her joyful amazement she saw in a large auction room a chest that so far as her judgment and memory went was the very thing miss minturn wanted trembling with surprise and excitement betty bent over the longed-for piece of carved oak she asked to have it measured she examined the locks the feet the interior the carving she had it turned over and over the man smiled a little at her pretense of knowledge and only her winsome face gained from him the attention he believed thrown away 
looking at her catalogue she found it was time for the sale the chest was number nineteen on the list miss minturne was out of the city for the day what should she do on whom could she call for help in this emergency if she bought the chest she would have to leave a deposit on it at once she had no money fortunately she had miss minturne's card with her she would use that and if necessary her diamond ring that had been redeemed from its servitude at the pawn shop but the chest might be a clever reproduction oh horrors what should she do should she run the risk of buying a reproduction or lose the chest the chest that miss minturne had lain awake nights trying to plan some means of procuring it seemed cowardly to disappoint her because of the fear of making a mistake she must run the risk she must buy it if it proved a mistake she would again pawn her ring the auctioneer had begun his sing-song going going by the time betty had resolved to do and dare and the old carved chest was put up for sale poor betty waited her heart beating wildly as one then another bid on it at last the bidders dwindled down to two who seemed very much in earnest then betty raised her catalogue for the next bid she was regarded with amazement by those who knew that the quiet elderly man in the same row of chairs with her who nodded his bid so unostentatiously had millions back of him presently the third bidder stopped and it lay between betty and the elderly man who leaned over to see his opponent when for the first time a change came into his immobile face and a twinkle crept into his eyes betty feeling her heart sink as the bids rose did not glance towards him her opponent smiling behind his short gray mustache raised the bids by such small amounts that the auctioneer spoke irritably about it but seeing who the bidder was he accepted with what meekness he could the small advances and kept patiently on with the one dollar additions the gray-haired man watched betty with amused eyes and perhaps she was the only one in the room who did not know that the great millionaire was for some reason giving her the benefit of the sale frightened at her own audacity and quivering at every increase of the price betty kept bravely on her lip trembling and only her courage and her love for miss minturne keeping her to the straining conflict oh if that man would only stop oh if miss minturne were only here these wishes were hardly formulated for the sharp bidding had to be kept up once she could not make out where they were and had to ask the auctioneer in a frightened voice just when betty had reached the limit set by miss minturne her opponent shook his head he would not bid again and the chest was betty's her eyes were suffused and she could not collect her thoughts when the attendant came to get her name and the customary deposit she hadn't any money she drew a long breath and handed miss minturne's card to him the man took it smiling and carried it to the bookkeeper who looked down the room at betty and shook his head the attendant came back looking less smiling you are not miss minturne he said inquiringly no but i am her representative betty managed to say is there anyone here who can identify you he asked no i am quite a stranger betty was forced to reply the man pondered a moment while betty gazed around the room hoping to see some friend of miss minturne's whom she had met at her numerous afternoon teas her eyes fell on the gray-haired man and her face brightened why there is mr anstice he will identify me mr anstice exclaimed the surprised youth turning to where that gentleman was trying to catch betty's eye and smiling pleasantly in a moment he was seated beside betty and identifying her to the complete satisfaction of all concerned i am so thankful sighed betty turning to him i have had such a time getting that chest oh mr anstice it is genuine isn't it yes it is genuine mr anstice answered smiling his quiet amused smile for he saw endless fun to come out of this episode and he loved a joke better even than his antiques and almost as much as he admired miss minturne he was delighted that betty had not discovered in him her rival bidder for the chest i am so relieved that you think it is genuine said betty starting up 
i must get out for a little fresh air mr anstice followed for the chest was the only thing in the collection he had wanted when they reached the door the color began to creep back into betty's face oh mr anstice it was perfectly awful she began while they walked down the avenue i don't know who was bidding against me but i was dreadfully afraid he had more money than i had i wonder if he was much disappointed i should hate to have him disappointed but it could not mean as much to any one else as to miss minturn but it does seem as though one couldn't lose when one begins bidding i wonder if it isn't like gambling i mean the desperate feeling i didn't know what i should do when they refused to take take miss minturn's card it looked as if i were an impostor and i was terrified because i thought they wouldn't let me have the chest mr anstice was pulling fiercely at his short mustache while betty talked on she was excited for the strain had been long and hard and she felt a certain relaxation in talking it over her companion was naturally silent and to-day he had less than usual to contribute to the conversation for he was determined to keep his part in the affair concealed until he saw miss minturn when they reached the studio mr anstice said he would go in and see how miss minturn felt about the chest she may be home by this time though she thought she would not be able to return until evening betty said i'll come in and see and perhaps when she finds you have bought the chest she will be in a particularly genial mood and invite me to have a cup of tea they found miss minturn in the studio and at first betty ran impulsively to her to tell the news though rather put out that mr anstice was there to spoil the tale but trained by her mother to give way before older people she did not begin but went into another room this did not suit mr anstice at all and he followed her aren't you going to tell miss minturn about your great piece of luck i thought i, I didn't want to intrude stammered betty miss minturn came in and pulled her down on a settle by her side asking how she had spent the morning betty blushed and looked at mr anstice if that horrid man would only go she thought she admired him but she could not go over the story as she wished before him she had told him a part but not that it was miss minturn's great need that had made her so desperate for that she considered a business secret why what does this mean miss minturn asked looking from mr anstice to betty and back again miss minturn i did an awful thing perfectly awful commenced betty but it turned out all right i am sure for mr anstice says it's genuine now betty evidently you have a story and won't you please begin somewhere near the beginning begged miss minturn laughing yet anxious to fathom the mystery she and mr anstice had been lifelong friends and though he was an enigma to the world miss minturn knew him through and through and he did not object to her knowledge having loved her hopelessly since his tenth year as he told every one and now she saw that he was brimming over with some joke probably at her expense where shall i begin asked betty tapping her foot on the rug and looking inquiringly into miss minturn's gray eyes it seems years since this morning i bought the things you needed at dean's then on my way home i passed lisa's auction rooms and you know i never pass without going in and oh miss minturn will you believe it i saw exactly the kind of chest you want the right size and all for i measured it now isn't it too bad that i was away things always happen so she moaned speaking to mr anstice i have longed almost prayed for that chest and to be away this morning of all mornings and this poor child unknown and oh well my luck is certainly deserting me everything went wrong with me this morning several times betty tried to interrupt but miss minturn was facing mr anstice during her woeful monologue and would not listen mr anstice's smile persisted how can you smile when you know the pride i take in my work and the hard time i have had proving it is not a rich woman's fad asked miss minturn reproachfully i am perfectly chastened i shall try to be more discreet mr anstice returned pulling a long face he looked at betty but miss minturn almost screamed betty i bought the chest at miss minturn's expression of utter amazement theodore anstice laughed until tears filled his eyes 
it is worth my entire collection of chests isabel to see you at this moment betty how could you do it she asked dazed you didn't have enough money to pay down and no one knows you mr anstice identified me oh were you there yes miss minturne and mr anstice says it is genuine that was what frightened me most i thought it might be a reproduction oh i had a terrible time a horrid person i think it was a man kept bidding on and on and i was so afraid he might have more money than i for i would not go beyond your price but the ogre stopped suddenly and you have the chest ogre exclaimed mr anstice under his breath say that's a good one ogre and mr anstice chuckled all the way home what is this i hear about a chest asked dr baird they sat as usual around the fire after dinner betty told the joyous story and even drowsy edwina opened her eyes with interest when she heard of the mighty homeric struggle to quiet mrs baird these graphic descriptions of the hurry and competition of new york seemed very much like a dream i am glad my lot was cast in less strenuous circumstances i don't see how you stand it little daughter it is a strain said betty thoughtfully but i don't feel it because i come home every night i am sorry for those who never get out of it yet there is something good too in feeling yourself a part of humanity out here one is more a part of nature it was the original plan for people to live in a garden wasn't it asked lois turning respectfully to the doctor for lois loved to discuss biblical subjects then began one of their long discussions and betty and edwina had their evening secrets before the sandman came around edwina sat on a stool at betty's feet with her little arms resting on her cousin's knees her sweet baby face now grown round and pink lifted up adoringly you are the image of a grinling gibbon's cherub cried betty smothering her with kisses how many quarrels has the cherub had with dotty to-day edwina stood up and whispered into betty's ear a sad tale of dotty's greed in wanting to play all the time with the queen of hearts not letting the cherub have it for a single minute betty opened her eyes wide with astonishment and whistled sympathetically edwina continued to whisper her grievances were many when she found a good listener betty grew more and more indignant at dotty's actions and the fascinating secrets were prolonged until betty had dexterously carried edwina up to the much hated bed end of chapter twenty four recording by holly jensen chapter twenty five of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty five betty's client mother what do you think cried betty giving mrs baird a hug then tearing out her hat pins wildly and throwing her hat on a table her coat on one chair and gloves on another each toss expressive of triumphant exultation oh she threw herself into a chair and hurled her overshoes to the hearth everybody guess what has happened you are going to decorate someone's house cried lois jumping up and clapping her hands sit down child said betty with a lofty wave of her hand you are not even warm now mother miss minturne has paid you well a dozen compliments as many as you have chairs occupied now replied her mother her amused eyes going from chair to chair a compliment sniffed betty in fine disdain she looked around at edwina who was running panting into the room vexed that her cousin had gotten in without her seeing her first and who climbed into her lap and kissed her demonstratively eddie guess what nice thing has happened to cousin betty edwina looked wise somebody gave you a box of candy she said gazing significantly at a white box betty had dropped on the sofa betty hugged her laughing a word to the wise that's to me is sufficient she said and opened a dainty white box of hylers gravely and carefully edwina selected her favorite sweets and then slid down to the floor in front of the open fire well broke out betty she turned impressively to her mother and lois 
i have had two articles accepted by the domicile mrs baird's eyes beamed with pride and she kissed betty and smoothed back the hair from the white forehead she loved you haven't heard all i am to write a series betty's voice grew almost sepulchral in her efforts to give adequate expression to her fullness of heart and pride of achievement what does all this mean asked dr baird who had been compelled to take a later train and had not heard the news betty had always loved to give startling information but to-day she could not answer her father and ran upstairs leaving that pleasant task to her more than willing mother she went straight to her room where she had written the literary essays the room where she had read and reread the letters of the sad polite editors where she had realized that pickles even betty's best brand failed to give spice to life that preserves cloyed and that purple top turnips were but a ravishing vision and where she had christened the library the silver lining library in honor of mr webby's henchman mr cloud despite all these awakenings betty's faith in life was unspoiled and her splendid courage had not failed and now her faith was justified finally she stole down to the little circle very quietly her father made a place for her at his side the sweet-smelling hickory leaped and blazed on the hearth and for a few minutes not a sound was heard but its cheerful crackling old katie found the group silent but smiling when she stood on the threshold for an instant surveying them fondly before she announced dinner served miss helen the busy winter passed rapidly for betty every month an article on household decoration appeared in the domicile and its readers were beginning to ask who this b b was who had such sensible original ideas betty did not deny lois's assertion that she never passed a newsstand without peeping into one of the magazines to catch a glimpse of the fascinating articles i don't do it she explained because i think they are good i haven't any opinion about their merits i feel that they must be poor because i wrote them but then i know that the editor would not publish trash so i don't think of it but oh how it stirs me to see b b and know it's me me listen to the great authoress laughed her mother actually mother my articles don't seem real to me my eyes sort of slide over the words i can't take them in as i do other people's the third article had appeared when one day as betty sat working over some designs a card was brought to her this must be for miss minturne i don't know any one of the name of dosworth said betty to the maid looking at the card take it to miss minturne the lady asked for miss b b and she said i was to say they sent her here from the domicile magazine oh oh exclaimed betty springing up it is for me say i'll be there in a moment and she hurried over to a mirror to smooth her hair then flew up a flight of stairs to wash her hands a small dignified-looking woman of about fifty stood up when betty came into the room i fear i have made a mistake she began i should like to see the woman b b who writes for the domicile i am deeply interested in her ideas poor betty trembled it was the first time she had even remotely heard or thought of herself as a woman and she felt dazed but surely girl or woman she had written those articles i-i wrote them she said deprecatingly you exclaimed the lady and the you had the ominous webby ring yes ma'am said poor betty so embarrassed that the old-fashioned form she had used conscientiously when a child leaped out she blushed scarlet when she heard her slip and tears came into her eyes you are so young said mrs dosworth seeing betty's embarrassment i was taken wholly by surprise i was told at the office where to find you and that b b was a woman that was all i could learn that is all they know because you see miss minturne said it would be better for me not to let them know that i was so young for it might make them think less of my stuff mrs dosworth smiled thinking that miss minturne whoever she might be was a wise counsellor for she herself feared to ask this young girl to help her in furnishing a memorial library in which she was deeply interested and about which she had come to consult b b 
are you here alone she asked somewhat incredulously no miss minturne has the studio and knows everything this tribute to the woman she admired slipped quite unconsciously from betty's lips for the one thought uppermost in her mind these days was miss minturne's vast knowledge in all things pertaining to her profession i should like to meet her if she's not too busy please excuse me and i shall tell her acquiesced betty oh miss minturne she cried when she found her a lady dosworth by name came to see me about those articles in the domicile and she nearly fainted when she saw what an impeccable webby kid i was she won't even talk to me she's that disappointed and disgusted and i believe she'll stop taking the magazine on account of their publishing things by such a dreadfully young girl miss minturne laughed at betty's quick imagination flashing from this occurrence to the woman's act of stopping her subscription well betty if i don't soon get to her and stop her and you you will be composing her haughty letter to the editor discontinuing the domicile miss minturne loved betty's ways and found herself she said growing young in the girl's youthful fancy and keen unspoiled interest in life and things as they crowded about her mrs dosworth's relief was evident when she saw miss minturne's tall figure and gray hair i have just been talking with this young girl she began cordially and smiling sweetly at betty as she might betty said afterwards at a child who had shown some fascinating baby trick miss minturne's face grew cold and puzzled young girl yes pursued mrs dosworth raising her voice slightly as if miss minturne were deaf or obtuse this young b b she added facetiously i fancy you are referring to my associate miss betty baird answered miss minturne with a note of interrogation in her voice mrs dosworth reddened she is very young you know and i was surprised she explained apologetically young people are doing original things these days i fear i am old-fashioned i hope miss baird will pardon my lack of ardor or was it courtesy oh please don't said betty who disliked above everything to have an apology addressed to her miss minturne interrupted her these articles by miss baird are indeed the best things we have had for a long time i think they are sufficient proof of her ability mrs dosworth looked chastened and miss minturne seeing it at once proceeded to make herself agreeable as only she could her gift in fascination amounting to genius mrs dosworth was skilfully drawn out about her plans for the library to be placed in one of the small towns in new jersey it was to be a memorial to her late husband and she put her whole heart into it miss minturne was soon all enthusiasm and the three talked and planned until luncheon time when miss minturne asked mrs dosworth to luncheon with them in her home that they might continue the subject before mrs dosworth left it was settled that betty with miss minturne's help was to make the designs for the decoration of the library and submit them to her for consideration betty immediately began on the absorbing undertaking she loved color and had always taken keen delight in color schemes of any kind and now here was her opportunity to put into practice all the ideas she had written about for the domicile End of chapter 25. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 26 of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 26. Success. Mrs. Dosworth has written, Betty Darling oh what did she say miss minturne asked betty anxiously drawing near miss minturne's desk i have only read half the letter let me see she is delighted with your designs and colors she has adopted them with scarcely an alteration betty whirled around on one foot waving her hand and crying three cheers for dosworth library then dropping down on the couch she listened breathlessly to the letter that miss minturne too was excited was evidenced by the red spots on her cheeks and her bright eyes and quick nervous reading 
well this is a triumph for a beginner she exclaimed when she had finished thrusting the letter into its envelope her pleasure growing as she realized all it meant to the girl by her side i am so glad miss minturne said betty so awfully glad and proud i owe it all to you she added taking miss minturne's hand and kissing it lovingly then though she felt some awe of the dignified woman she threw her arms around her waist and gave her one of the bear hugs she usually saved for her parents miss minturne kissing betty tenderly said with tears in her eyes it has been a long time child since i have been kissed by any one who loved me she stood up and going over to her table began to sort the mail briskly and returned to her old way of laughing and taking life as a clever comedy but betty could not go calmly on in the old routine it was all new and glorious she longed to tell the home folks for her first and strongest impulse when anything unexpected came to her was to tell someone and now she must tell somebody about the dosworth library if she had to go out and take one of those wonderful policemen by his shining buttons and hold him till the tale was done miss minturne was trying to pick up the day's work miss minturne betty hesitated miss minturne smiled i think i really do i'll burst if i don't tell someone about the dosworth library miss minturne leaned back in her chair and laughed as betty did not imagine she could ever have laughed even in childhood oh you darling child of course you must tell someone what have i become i am a stick and i am so dull i am not even a silver-headed walking stick just a lump betty had heard enough of miss minturne to know that a lump expressed her deepest scorn of frail human intelligence and feeling it was far worse than being a clod how can we celebrate where can you go to whom can you tell the news i think father could spare the time to listen if you don't need me it's three hours till luncheon when i shall see him of course but i can't wait three hours betty though deeply in earnest saw the humor clearly enough to join in miss minturne's merriment put your hat on at once betty and go and tell your father and if you see mr anstice tell him too he knows that you are working on the plans miss minturne's eyes twinkled when she said this anticipating mr anstice's delight in being stopped on his way to his office where his business was transacted in millions to hear a glowing account of the new jersey library it would she knew give him a taste of the long-forgotten joy of youth he will be pleased won't he answered betty i hope i shall see him he has never got over that chest i never knew a man who took such an interest in things she did not meet mr anstice but she did see jack brooks with his mother in his automobile something in her face stopped them and betty told in a few words thrilling with enthusiasm about the dosworth library she was so free from conceit that while her words seemed to relate to some marvellous event she never played the part of the heroine it was the romantic and astounding fact not her part in it that gave such a glamour to betty's narrative the world was a beautiful place and in it as in any wonderland strange and unexpected gifts dropped continually to-day it was the dosworth library it did not matter much on whom they dropped she was absolutely impersonal about it it was this trait that endeared her to every one it was this that made people young when with her they felt a return to that enchanting period in life when any door might lead to fairyland any tree shower down golden apples and every rainbow had its bag of gold every country its golden fleece no wonder miss minturne had grown not only to love her but to find that things were flat without her views her translations of them into terms of youth terms that are after all the abiding ones adorable youth mr anstice was wont to exclaim after he and betty had had a long talk at first the exclamation disconcerted her but his kind tired eyes smiled back into hers and she was satisfied not to understand but to believe in him as she did in miss minturne she classed it to use his own adjective as adorable irony
after telling the brookses the good report from the library betty sped up fifth avenue in a whirl not unlike that in her own brain betty was swept up in the elevator to the tenth story of the immense building where her father was she found him alone in his office oh father she cried throwing herself into his arms we can all go to europe now miss minturne has just received a letter from mrs dosworth and she says the color scheme the style of furniture the plans about the books you helped there and so did my experience in the silver lining library are all satisfactory isn't it wonderful i knew it was in you elizabeth and now you have proven it and after all your discouragements how pleased your mother will be why i can hardly wait to go home and tell her i know now whom i take after laughed betty delighted with her father's almost boyish glee in the news i simply had to tell you now i must hurry back for i have to begin work the next day miss minturn was at her desk addressing dainty envelopes the pile grew higher and higher betty she called without turning her head or looking up in an instant betty was by her side now child read this and tell me how many you will need for your own friends betty took up one of the finely engraved notes and could scarcely believe her eyes when she ran across her own name it was an invitation to a reception in the studio rooms to be given for miss baird oh she exclaimed and she stood stock still looking at the invitation this is to be a little afternoon affair miss minturne explained a sort of coming out for you an artistic coming out instead of a social one though it will be for both for i have asked my special friends the ones you will care most for and you must ask all the friends you want betty was speechless she knew how busy and preoccupied miss minturne was and to take this time and trouble for her miss minturne she began in a voice shaking with feeling then broke down and ran from the room of course lois was to participate in everything just as betty herself did and it would be in that way a coming out tea for lois in new york though she had been formally presented to society at her own home in baltimore the two friends had a glorious evening going over the names of people to be invited there were all the teachers at the pines and the few girls that remained who had been their particular friends mrs king was of course the first name written down dorothy unfortunately was still abroad jessie bentworth was too far off to come but she received an invitation caroline wren and helen dyke would come the girls in weston could not accept but they should receive invitations every one of them and bishop wayborn and his grandsons paul and reginald one name remained miriam kendall miriam who had made betty's first year at the pines so hard miriam lived in new york but lois and betty had not yet run across her yes i shall send one to miriam life is too short for continuing such wretched feelings said betty putting down miriam's name i think so too said lois heartily i was hoping you would decide that way when betty told her mother she kissed her saying gently this is the best of all little daughter end of chapter twenty six recording by holly jensen Chapter Twenty Seven of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twenty Seven: The Reception. The studio was charmingly lighted by scores of candles. Spring flowers, fresh from the ground, abounded. The tang of wet earth and sunshine and spring rain still clinging to them burnished copper mingled its soft glow with the sunny gleams of old brass sheffield plate and queen anne silver hobnobbed with quaint pewter pieces priceless eastern rugs covered the floor and were like counterparts of the stained glass through which the waning daylight flickered and betty's bouquets they were banked on mantelpieces tables everywhere mr anstice sent a countless number he vowed that betty should have more than any other debutante in all greater new york 
then there were the kings and mrs brooks's jacks and craigs and dunnies and mrs dosworth's while several dozens came from the friends of miss minturn who had grown to be friends with betty at the many afternoon teas the pines girls and teachers sent another dozen or more and bishop wayborn himself sent roses with many wishes for betty's health and happiness paul's offering was an immense cluster of yellow roses of the same variety as the one she wore the night they met at the pines reginald's was orchids altogether betty had outrivalled everyone in her number of bouquets and even mr anstice was satisfied betty's gown was exquisite a present from her cousin miss payne it was of sheer white material and made with the highest art the result being a gown not only modish but of charming simplicity lois was very attractive in a parisian gown a fluffy pink and she carried a few lilies of the valley from a bouquet dunny had sent her her gentle high-bred face framed in the dark hair was smiling and happy and her cheeks since coming to the country had become delightfully rosy the two girls stood surrounded jack with his mother and dunny had come early and jack announced immediately that nothing would drive him away until the last guest had departed he had come to stay and dunny backed him royally in his determination mrs brooks was going on to another reception by and by two old schoolmates from kip academy are coming it's a surprise for you so i won't say another word said jack turning hastily away oh how mean exclaimed betty lois he has a surprise for me and won't tell me what it is listen to a girl's logic returned jack looking very superior as if a surprise would be a surprise if i told and he took his friend dunny's arm and pretended to walk away do do tell me pleaded betty her curiosity aroused what is jack teasing you about asked mary king mary he has a surprise and he won't tell me what it is answered betty oh good there's craig ellsworth unmindful of her place in a very informal receiving line betty hurried off to greet the clamor boy of course jack and craig were acquainted and they with mary and lois soon formed an interested circle around dr and mrs baird doesn't mrs baird look like a picture in that fashionable dress and hat against that background of old rose wall whispered lois to mary as they came up lois drew close to mrs baird oh isn't this the loveliest reception you ever saw and isn't betty glorious it is delightful mrs baird's eyes followed her daughter in spite of her efforts to appear interested in other things betty was now welcoming three young ladies very beautifully gowned who with the perfect ease of those accustomed to many social affairs entered gracefully why mrs baird there are three of the pines girls one is miriam kendall think of it which one is miriam asked mrs baird the small dark-eyed one the other is caroline wren and the third helen dyke i must go over to them yes miriam had come with the warm firm handclasp that betty gave her all the old hard feeling vanished mr anstice and miss minturn stood a little aside after all there is nothing sweeter and dearer than a bevy of graceful pleasant well-bred girls said miss minturn these are uncommonly pretty too he answered studying the different groups yes said miss minturn thoughtfully and she glanced from one to another yes she repeated but it is their air of good breeding that constitutes their charm they are well-bred yes and that is rather striking is it not for i hear on all sides that our american girls are not so polite as their mothers were pure nonsense retorted miss minturn that's what every generation says of succeeding ones blessings brighten as they take their flight and our grandmothers believe they were pinks of perfection but i have my own opinion the girls now are much more wholesome than they were in my day i only hope they will preserve their charm along with this out-of-door manner they carry around with them they have so far they have a champion in you isabel mr anstice answered yet i agree with you but bless me how crude they seem were we like that he nodded towards a happy circle of laughing boys and girls yes just that light-hearted theo answered miss minturn it is better as it is now though isn't it 
how can i fail to believe in compensation when i am allowed to stand here by you and twenty years ago you hadn't time for theo anstice except to carry your coat oh cried miss minturne surely yes wherever i went i heard that repeated i only said it as a joke theo perhaps the compensation comes in that now i am willing and glad to carry your coat and you allow me he said slyly that's decidedly ambiguous i won't let you aim your sarcasm at me when i am having a children's party your revenge must be satisfied when you see me brought to giving children's parties like any good auntie you know isabel there is only one woman in the world for me and only one man for me theo but i won't tell you his name can you guess with a laugh miss minturne hurried away leaving mr anstice looking after her questioningly wait a moment isabel said an elderly woman putting out a detaining hand as miss minturne passed and with the other raising her jewelled lorgnette i want to congratulate you on your beautiful young friend she went on looking steadily at betty she is charming how well she stands i notice especially her respectful way of listening to older people a lost art isabel it delights me that she has met your approval dear mrs oakley answered miss minturne earnestly looking admiringly at the older woman the lorgnette dropped gracefully and a pair of keen eyes met hers you must bring her to my receptions there is not another girl unless i accept her dainty friend who suits me as she does you make me feel like a successful mamma laughed miss minturne but mrs oakley could see that her interest in betty had brought real warmth into her eyes and voice though according to her habit she had to laugh off her emotions mr anstice sauntered up who are these handsome youths who have just come in he asked miss minturne moved towards the door i don't know them i must go and speak to them why there is bishop wayborn with them they must be the grandsons betty has told me about betty said jack in a low tone be prepared your surprise has come betty looked round eagerly oh she exclaimed and clasped her hands delightedly why didn't they tell me they were coming there were the bishop and his grandsons paul and reginald speaking to miss minturne betty ran over to them and the bishop held her hands in his old kind way so long that reginald interposed i think you might let us have one at least grandfather oh the greed of youth sighed the old gentleman and he turned to speak to dr baird who had crossed the room to meet him i never dreamed you would come exclaimed betty i say that is nice laughed reginald so we were not expected or wanted only invited you didn't dream we could stay away did you said paul gallantly reginald you are meaner every time i see you cried betty how did you manage to get away from school paul well i made up my mind to come and i came he laughed as he spoke but betty saw the old indomitable expression around his mouth well it was perfectly lovely of you both to come i never had such a glorious day betty sighed in her contentment betty you haven't changed a bit said reginald you are eighteen now aren't you you are only six months older so you can't patronize anyhow it's mighty good to see you again why here is lois he exclaimed betty had guided them up to the table where lois was pouring tea with dunny assisting her faithfully the afternoon passed swiftly with the continuous stream of arriving and departing guests the entrancing strains of soft music the merry hubbub of fresh young voices the festal slamming of carriage doors the calling of footmen the rolling of carriage wheels and puffings of automobiles the last vehicle to leave was the brooks's car bearing away dr and mrs baird betty lois jack and dunny it was an unqualified success said dr baird when the family had gathered together in the hall to talk over the reception betty smiled into the fire yes it was a beautiful affair mrs baird answered happily and we can never cease to be grateful to miss minturne yes and to mrs king said the doctor i am pretty tired said betty i think i'll say good-night so shall i said lois suppressing a yawn 
but when they began to comb their hair either because of the electricity that flew from the comb or of some elfish spirit that takes possession of girls when they comb their hair together at night suddenly they felt very wide awake and shrugging into their white dressing jackets they sat down on betty's window seat they soon commenced talking about everybody and everything and what everybody wore and what everybody said and what everybody must have felt and didn't say and what everybody said and didn't feel oh it was perhaps the best part of the reception didn't jack look handsome said lois yes and craig too said betty one would think he had attended receptions all his life i was so proud of him they were silent the night was warm and their window was thrown wide summer was coming betty leaned on the broad sill and lois among the pillows had her hands clasped around her knee both were tired from the unusual excitement and exertion of the day yet they could not make up their minds to go to bed outside the moon was rising above the cedar and in its light they could see the sparkling surface of the bay the outlines of the hills the cloudless sky and the shadowy garden while the gentle sounds of spring and the murmuring fall of water through the mill gate rose to them intermittently betty broke the silence i feel lois that our life will be different from this time on i too feel that way i hate to go to bed wasn't it splendid betty to see the bishop's grandsons again betty moved uneasily they haven't changed much have they pursued lois no returned betty hesitatingly you and paul began lois betty interrupted her by tossing back her hair from her face and standing up i think i must go to bed don't betty i couldn't sleep i feel that i shall never sleep again interposed betty my head is in a whirl we had a fine time anyway said lois glorious paul never took his eyes off you persisted lois we are good friends yet i can get on with jack so much more easily said betty yes you are different with paul you are rather quiet he kind of scares me paul i thought you admired him so i do i admire him until i can't tell the difference twixt tweedledum and tweedledee when i am with him said betty poor jack poor craig poor reginald not poor dunny retorted betty just then the owl in the cedar tree gave out its rattle note unvaried the owl is hooting at us said betty the girls laughed softly the moon now standing above the cedar threw its brightest beams on the old house betty leaned out of the window and lovingly patted the broad old shingles where the moonlight rested placidly you dear old house you won't have a mortgage on you long end of chapter twenty seven recording by holly jensen end of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel